Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is part two of a special Middle East edition of City Talk. And like all good serial soap operas, we need a minute to bring you back to the action. Last week, Ambassador Richard Murphy took us on a tour of the Middle East. We visited uh, Palestine, we visited Israel, we visited Iraq. Today, we'll go to Iran, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. With me is Ambassador Richard Murphy, a longtime and distinguished Middle East hand. He has served as U.S. Ambassador to Syria and Saudi Arabia, among other postings, and he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs during the Reagan administration. During that time, he was particularly active in the Arab-Israeli peace process. He is currently a frequent TV commentator and expert on things Middle East and international relations. Again, welcome. Thank you. Last week, we had ended <clears throat> the segment with looking at prospects in Iraq, both domestically, you foresaw certain situations under which that the United States would withdraw and declare victory. And then... Let's start with that. What do you see happening in the United States, given what we're seeing on the ground in Iraq? Well, what, what I uh, mentioned in the previous broadcast was I think that the combination of our own military's concern about the strain on the forces, particularly the reserve forces, uh, and the growing uneasiness on the public's part about the loss of life, uh, will by, before a year has passed, as the congressional elections uh, uh, approach in 06, mean that uh, the administration is almost bound to announce a substantial cutback on the troops in Iraq. I don't expect them to march out of Iraq. That would be very irresponsible. But I expect them to get the message across, we are moving ahead successfully. The Iraqis are training up and will be soon able to take care of their own security. That, that, that would be the argument, that they could take the lead. But the, the, the numbers of battalions, etc., that are combat ready for the Iraqis seems extraordinarily low. And yeah. that timetable of a year, just doing the mathematics, doesn't seem to work out to a viable solution on the ground. No, it doesn't. Uh, I think uh, the analysts who've looked at the history of insurgencies have said something like nine years is the average before you can get on top of and control, put back, put down an insurgency. And I don't think our public's going to support us out front in major numbers with our troops uh, in that country for nine years. That's, that's my personal view. But, uh, you know, the loss of life is still, thank God, but a fraction of what it was in Vietnam. But the media focus has been so intense uh, week after week mm -hmm. about who died, the age, where they came from. The life I stories, the biographies. The life stories that, that uh, I think it's having a broader effect across the country than, uh, than we had anticipated in going in. Of course, we didn't expect to be at this point now. Okay, well, let's, let's go to that. I mean, this, in retrospect, I mean, what uh, are the strategic errors and what are the lessons to be learned both in the situation now and in the future, what are these larger Iraqi lessons? Well, the administration had reason to be suspicious of the effectiveness of UN institutions, of European uh, readiness to move, ability to pull themselves together to confront the threat which Washington saw in uh, the reports they had of weapons of mass destruction in Iraqi hands. Mm -hmm. Uh, it turned out the intelligence was wrong. So uh, the Bush doctrine of preemptive strikes was based on, at the minimum, practically, 
good intelligence, which didn't occur, irrespective of the, you know, the worth of it as strategic doc doctrine. And based on the assumption that when we acted, because others would be too slow or too hesitant to act, we would get legitimacy after the fact. And it hasn't happened. Wh why? And it didn't happen right away. I mean, just the looting immediately yeah. after the the military action was over showed that we th there was no enforcement of stability. There was no security. Well, we weren't seen as either competent or disinterested in bringing uh, a new regime to power in Iraq, and we we just didn't have the respect either of the international community, much less of the Iraqis. The looting that took place scared the daylights out of the Iraqis. There was nothing worse, as they said, than Saddam uh, being in power to have anarchy and chaos, looting and total lawlessness. It was brought to a relatively quick conclusion, but it was three months or so where it was wild and it, it was frightening. And then uh, we weren't seen as competent in foreseeing what would have to be done to restart government in Iraq. And as I said, we're not seen as disinterested because you talk to any Iraqi and most people in the region, we're there for only two reasons. One was to grab Iraqi oil, which I disagree with. I don't think that's the case. And the other that was, was the to... That wasn't the goal of U.S. policy. No, I don't think it was. Okay. Uh, and in witness of that fact, we have not made a single move towards uh, privatizing Iraqi oil, which was under national mm -hmm. oil company control. We've not moved to grab Iraqi oil. It's going where the market dictates when it goes. And the trouble is it's not moving right. that, that fast right. and in that quantity we thought it would. Right. That it would be a self-sustaining occupation for a few months, then they'd pay their own way. And the other is uh, the region is convinced we're there to help Israel by destroying an enemy of Israel. Uh, there's something to that. I mean, this, the, I can understand the charge because Saddam was a committed enemy mm. of Israel. Right. And it was a big state and with a record of being determined to do what it could to hurt Israel. And, and, and willing to use military means in violation of convention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. But, I mean, they say that's the only, those are the only two reasons we went into Iraq, and that's, that's the lens the optic they're seeing us, everything we do through those. And there's nothing lenses. that we can do to change. Is, I mean, have we changed that optic? Or not, is the optic is changed. dead with just incompetent? Uh, well, just incompetent until proven <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> otherwise yeah. And you talked about the importance of legitimacy. Is, is the American occupation in any way seen as legitimate? And is the government that is in formation perceived to be legitimate? Well, I think if anyone can be objective about Iraq, the fact is it is more legitimate than the first government was, which we put in. Right. And our fingerprints were all over it. Now, this is the son or grandson of that first government. And there are still, obviously, American influences on its formation. But we've tried to step back. We've tried to say, look, uh, recognize the demographic realities. The Shia are 60% of the country. One man, one vote, they're going to they're gonna be uh, dominant, but the minority rights have to be respected. All nice, honest American sentiments, but not <laughs> pleasing to many Iraqis. But they don't work on the ground. So far, so far. But, uh, you know, let's not give up hope. There's, okay. There's... Two years from now, what is the most likely geopolitical configuration of what we now call Iraq? What does it look like? What is, who's well, running it? A lot depends on where they want to move themselves. Uh, the Constitution, which we talked about in the earlier program, it's, yeah, it's a piece of paper, but it's generally worded. Uh, and there's room to interpret it in various ways. And if they take a positive look at it, that it's not just to shaft the uh, Sunnis mm -hmm. and put the Shia in charge, but that it does allow for the oil wealth to be distributed on an annual, uh, on a, a national basis mm -hmm. uh, per capita, uh, that it shouldn't could be considered either Kurdish oil or Shia oil. Sunnis in the center don't have any oil. Right. That's one of the problems. Right. Uh, if that's the way they interpret it and that's the way their institutions start to develop, then, you know, what we've done is going to be seen as a positive step. That. Uh, there's a fairer representation of the people in the national institutions. 
and those institutions will respect minority rights, will respect uh, an equal sharing uh, of, uh, of the wealth of the nation. But we're not there yet. Uh, that, so it could go either way, the positive way or the negative way, which could lead to a breakup of Iraq. That would be the worst scenario because a breakup of Iraq, I think, would present an extraordinary temptation to the Turks to move into the north, to the Iranians to move in from the east. And then, and, and, if, and if we then are withdrawn, if we withdraw or are in some sense driven out, we have created a huge vacuum that's going to create a clash, as you just suggested. That, that, that could be, the, uh, in my view, the worst uh, possible outcome. Uh, uh, so we've talked a lot about having a federal system. Well, a federal system wasn't easy for us. 200 years back, it wasn't easy to mm -hmm. get to a federal system of government. It has never been a pattern of government in the Middle East. There's one other example, and that's the uh, small, very wealthy state in the Persian Gulf called uh, the United Arab Emirates that's a federal system. Every other government in that part of the world has had a strong central government and the idea of federal sharing of powers, province to national government just this hasn't been there. doesn't exist. So that's our hope, but can we sell that is not clear. Let's move to one of the powers that you just talked about, and that's, that's Iran. Iran has got a new president. What does that election mean? And for U.S., Iranian relationships, Iranian regional relationships, where is Iran? What role can and will Iran play? Well, again, we have to admit we miscalled it uh, in Iran because we thought that uh, the country was uh, divided between the moderates and the conservatives, right. as we call them. The moderates had had their president in charge for two terms, and that we were enormously popular, and our values, our ideals were very much respected by the young of Iran who wanted to get out from under a theocracy, and by the women of Iran who didn't want to have the pressures uh, that the religious conservatives were putting on them. Now, this is just wishful thinking. Is this backed up by any empirical analysis, or is this just what you would like to believe? You the, see what you want well, to say. Well, the empirical analysis is it was a bum call because they had an election in Iran, and the man who was so far below our radar, uh, who was a very known as a hardliner, uh, Ahmadinejad, uh, uh, is suddenly elected president. Where are all the youth? Where are all the women? Was that a fraudulent election, or did we misjudge what the Iranians really wanted? So the pattern that I'm seeing in this conversation and our previous conversations is almost our utter in inability to understand the, the targets of our influence or our power. It's just this universal ignorance. Well, if there's anything good to come out of the post-war years in Iraq, I think it's a broader realization in our own country that even we, the sole remaining superpower, have our limits, and we better move carefully and try to look very uh, closely at the value of the intelligence that we produce and our friends produce. Yeah, it's almost like Gulliver and Lilliput. You have this giant who's tied down, but in some ways tied down by himself or herself. You know, trying not to be too masculine, gender oriented here. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the hyper power looks powerless. It looks like this awkward, flailing giant. I, it looks like we look less powerful than we did before. Well, there's been a change, and I, you can date it to the beginning of the second term of this administration. A, a change back to where we used to be that is a, it's useful to have allies. Because with allies and friends, we get broader support, not military support. We don't need military support. We are a true massive superpower in arms. But we don't have yet the legitimacy which would sustain us in efforts to reshape that area. Okay, let's go, let's go back to Iran as a case in point. But neither us, the United States, nor the Western Europeans, or nor the, West, the rest of the world seems to have had much influence on Iran and certainly the, de the development of at least the capability of producing atomic weapons. Well, the, uh, the goal of atomic weapons is pretty popular in Iran. Start with that. That's a, that, I think, is a given. Uh, it's a sign of their pride, they, their stature, and their, for some of them, a sense that 
without atomic weapons, uh, they aren't going to be able to keep us at bay. So the deterrent works. I mean, that's the North Korean argument yeah. as well, assuming yeah. that we have an interest to be there. But that doesn't mean we can't make a deal. Okay. And it started with the French, the British, and the Germans working together, making proposals, providing some incentives to the Iranians to not reopen their uh, their fuel cycle uh, work on the on the nuclear uh, on their uranium stockpiles. Uh, the Iranians played along with that. Then they said no, but it wasn't an absolute no. We uh, finally came in support of the Europeans and. Uh, there is a deal there somewhere. I don't think we've got it yet. Uh, okay. We've shaped it yet. But it's going to involve not just economic incentives to Iran in terms of trade. We've sanctioned them. We've, we've been pretty effective at curbing their, the growth of their uh, oil industry, for instance, by being, making it difficult for, uh, forbidden for American companies to invest in mm -hmm. Iran. Uh, and we slowed things down there. But uh, oil prices are up. And they, you know they're doing pretty well right now uh, with their income from the oil that they do produce. In a previous conversation, I think two conversations ago, you mentioned the, the idea of a nuclear-free zone in the region, yeah. which would really essentially be Iran, if if and when, and Israel, which does have. What are the prospects of such an agreement? And wouldn't that necessarily mean that the Israelis would have to come under our nuclear umbrella and would they trust us and would we want to do it? The prospects of a nuclear free zone at this point in time are as close to zero as anything okay. I've ever suggested. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, but, Sorry you know, I brought it up. Well, the only, the only hope out there is that um, the Israelis have said they'd be ready to talk about uh, nuclear arms and conceivably limitations without admitting that they have any. Mm -hmm. Uh, two years after a general peace in the area between Israel and, okay. and the region. Uh, that they said 10 years ago, and they still don't That's have a general table, peace. It's on the table, right, yeah. and, and, and not likely. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't see why it isn't part of our uh, diplomatic uh, arsenal, if you will, uh, to have that. The problem with the idea has been poisoned by being sponsored by Iran for several years. So uh, if Iranians want it, hey. hey we don't want it. Don't I mean, that, that, that makes perfect yeah. sense. The relationship of Iran and Shia Iraq, does the current situation provide a, an incentive for Iran to involve itself in, in, in Iraq? Well, it says it's not, but we're convinced, uh, we, Washington is convinced, uh, based on all the reports it gets, that there are Iranian agents active in Iraq and that uh, those include Iranians themselves and includes protégés of Iran who fled Saddam Hussein and who lived for upwards of 20 years in Tehran mm -hmm. under Iranian protection and who were well disposed towards Iran. The Iranians come back and say, well, that doesn't mean we want to recreate the Iranian system in Iraq of a theocratic, theocratic government because, A, there are only 60 percent of the country are Shia. Uh, and those 60 percent are divided. Some of them are very secular. They, mm -hmm. So for us to try to impose our system is, uh, would be destabilizing, and we want stability. That's the nice interpretation, uh, interpretation which they're, they're quick to put on it. Give me the malign interpretation. Uh, that they're lying. Uh, and that uh, in any case, whether they impose a theocratic or bring that about, uh, they are bound and determined to regard <laughs> geographic realities. Iraq is their backyard, and they don't want an unfriendly country there, and they certainly don't want a prolonged American presence there. Right. So we did them a great service by getting rid of Saddam Hussein, and this is why you've had that very edgy set of comments by the Saudi foreign minister. We, meaning the United States right. and uh, Saudi Arabia, cooperated in the 80s to fight, uh, to oppose Iran taking over Iraq, and today America appears to be doing everything it can to give Iraq to Iran. That's a sign from a fellow who's generally very careful with his words of the level of uneasiness about a Shia majority becoming the leadership in Iraq and possibly arousing similar sentiments down in the Gulf. Um, Saudi Arabia, they're a distinct minority, 10, 15 percent maybe. But giving ideas which the Saudis would rather truly not. Truly destabilizing. Yeah. Truly destabilizing. Yeah, they are nervous. 
Are we nervous? And are we sufficiently nervous? Well, uh, I, I don't know, honestly, the answer to that question. Uh, we're certainly hearing it from a number of sources, the King of Jordan, the Saudi leaders, uh, um, they who have stood by us in some very difficult times are nervous about Iran. Talk, to, talk about Jordan and the King's role in regional peace activities. You were just there. Well, it, con it continues, Jordan continues to uh, try to play a uh, stabilizing role and to uh, keep uh, open door to Israel. It signed the peace treaty back in 94. That 11 years have gone by. Uh, there has been peace, and the, the uh, relations have, uh, or there's been no infiltration. The uh, government in Jordan has been very careful to, uh, key. it has a good counterintelligence uh, service to intercept anybody trying to make trouble across the Jordan River mm -hmm. to penetrate uh, from there into Israel. Uh, but I have to say that uh, it is still popularly referred to as the King's Peace, not our Jordanian peace. So uh, that was just a, just a warning note that the leadership that the late King Hussein showed is yet to be fully embraced by his own people. They're, they're suspicious and they, they see the pressures on the Palestinians as a threat not only to the West Bankers and the Gazans, but there's still a potential threat to them. It was Sharon himself who formally said, right. Jordan is Palestine. Right. They haven't forgotten that. And, and, they, and they're not likely to domestically. Uh, we talked uh, in May about the autumn of the autocrats. Is, you know, is it autumn? Is it autumn in Jordan? Well, the, the king appears to be pretty popular. Okay. Uh, and and you've got a, a fairly substantial legislative well, for he, that you region. Well, he's, he's not a constitutional right, monarch. Right. But, uh, so is he moving that direction? Some of the words suggest yes, some of the steps taken, but he still retains uh, a great deal of authority over who's in the government and uh, how the elections will be run. Let's, let's move to Syria. Now, Syria has been, I, I said in the opening and the earlier show, Syria seems to be in the American crosshairs. We've got uh, military operations that are right on the Syrian border. Uh, I don't know if they have yet, either officially or unofficially, crossed into the border like we did in Vietnam, into Cambodia. There, are, there is potential conflict here. And are we goading the Syrians into... Uh, it looks like we're pushing them, are we? And when, what are we pushing them toward? Uh, some in Washington give every sign of uh, thinking that it would be good to see a change of the regime in Syria. And that doesn't mean an American military intervention. Maybe it's enough to have a sort of psychological warfare that uh, uh, military means are on the table. Nothing's off the table. We've said that repeatedly about U.S. Syrian uh, moves. I don't think there's a prospect of uh, repeating the military intervention that we made in Iraq, repeating it in Syria. I would think that the, the, the Syrians would look at that and say they're not going to do it again unless they're totally irrational and they would sustain the, the losses both in terms of, you know, personnel and prestige that we did before. Uh, I think the Syrians are adept at playing for time, playing with a weak mm -hmm. hand. Uh, they have offered to cooperate on the border, and I don't think we've picked up that offer. We're working on the Iraqi side of the border with what Iraqi troops we can put together to try to close the border. I'm not aware that there's any cross-border cooperation with the Syrians. Are we missing an opportunity well, here? Well, I think we should be exploring that constantly. You say you want to stop this, or you say you're not sponsoring infiltration? Okay. What are you doing? Show us what you're doing. They've bulldozed parts of the border, building up a berm, they call mm -hmm. it, an earthworks, so that it demarcates the border and the messages stay out, but doesn't mean you can't climb over mm -hmm. it. Um, how much they're trying to seal the border, I don't know. It's a long border, and we shouldn't assume that their security, just because we don't like the way the Syrian government runs, and that there are a number of security services that the president of Syria is 
an absolute tyrant in full control of the Syrian territory. I mean, he may not be able to close the border. Right. So well, I think we should be looking at what ways we could uh, support a closure by some kind of cross-border cooperation. But uh, that is not Washington's attitude. Not at all. I don't think so, no. One more country in the region that we had talked about last time and that, there, you know, history has intervened, and that is in Lebanon, where you had the assassination of the former prime minister, you had the so-called Cedar Revolution, and then now you have this UN investigation, which is putting more heat on Syria. What's the story with Lebanon? I mean, is there a possibility that after these decades that you could have a unified Lebanon, a true nation state? Well, it's not... It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, the encouraging thing about the Cedar Revolution was that the factional symbols, the flags, everybody, every faction had its own mm -hmm. flag. The flag you saw was the Lebanese flag right. in these squares. Even the flags that uh, usually dominated a Hezbollah counter demonstration, the Hezbollah flags weren't showing. They were Lebanese flags. Um, but it's a system rooted in confessionalism. The job is tied to your religious affiliation. If you're a Sunni, if you're a Druze, if you're a uh, Maronite Catholic, uh, uh, you have rights that the other guy doesn't have to that job. Uh, that's not easily put aside uh, and forgotten. What we've got to do is look more closely at the history of these people and not assume they can leap over and that they're even interested in abandoning what we would consider baggage they should leave behind. Mm -hmm. It's part of their, their culture, their, their traditions. They're not going to just do, uh, make a move towards our view of democracy, freedom, etc. And this is a statement that it could apply to the entire region and any of the individual sure. Sure. Uh, countries there. Sure. Optimistic, pessimistic over the next year? You? Fascinated addicted to the Middle East, and, uh, you know, it's going to survive uh, both of us, I have a feeling. I, I, I hope so, in <laughs> fact, and I hope we survive it. Looking forward to our next okay. conversation. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Great pleasure.